Hello, good morning. A special greetings to you on the Lord's Day. And the Word of God says, This is the day that the Lord has made. And let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, here we are back again. Lockdown. Unlock, lockdown. I calculated this is the eighth time of this year that we meet uh, church through this means. Just starting this year. Well, I hope you are keeping well, staying safe, and doing your bit to protect the community. And we just continue to meet uh, and hope that in the very near future, we'll be meeting back here again physically. Well, as a church, we've been studying the book of Ephesians, and we're talking about the church. And in chapter 2, it tells us that this mystery has been broken down, and the church is no longer Jews or Gentiles, but a third race called Christians. And it says, verse 6, that both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body. And then it says that God's purpose then is that God will use this church, the church to display His wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So this Romans chapter 12 9 to 11, uh, 9 to 21. Romans chapter 12, 9 to 21. And I want to read it in a new living translation. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21 in new living translations. What a beautiful word from the Lord. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Will you join me uh, in prayer? Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, when we read through this, it sounds like the faith that we're having is some sort of a, a kind of doormat faith. It seems just too much to bear in a world where those who bully always seems to win. And, uh, and yet at the same time, when I read through this, I realize that this is not just, this is actually a rebellious faith. Um, that we rebel against how the world would naturally respond to this kind of treatment. But as we read through your word, we acknowledge that this is heaven's revolution. And we are called into it. So we want to worship uh, you and allow you to empower us to live the kind of life that you actually want us to live. Lord, we pray for our situation back again. Uh, lock up again, and, and, and we just want to pray that even despite of this, 
we will still know that you are in charge and you are in control. And thank you, Lord, for, for some of us who still live in relatively comfortable and, and rather convenience in some way. And, and we must not allow this to become something that it is expected, but we consider it as a blessing. And but we always ask uh, you are the last and you know the end from the very beginning. And you are sovereign, you are in charge, you know all. Help us to put our confidence, our trust in this Almighty God. Thank you for today that we can come together, even through this means uh, to worship. May you bless our time together. We ask this sincerely in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I invite you to uh, sing a song, just one announcement, and that is uh, KYB Term 4. We are doing uh, the life of Mo uh, Joseph, Genesis 36 for the uh, Term 4 books next week. So now I want to invite you to sing this beautiful song, The Lord is Our Salvation. of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on this solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear darkness falls His strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun The Lord is my salvation Who is like the Lord to
Praise the Lord. I now pass the time over to Pastor Caroline as she continues to bring God's word to us. Well, good morning, church. Uh, we continue this morning on our journey through this letter to the Ephesians. To what would have to be one of the most practical and helpful passages in the entire letter. It cuts to the very heart of how we should live as followers of Christ. And as was the case last week, there's no complicated theology in here. It's just good practical advice about how we should be living in response to everything that God has done for us, which Paul has already laid out in those first three chapters of this letter. So before we go any further, let's read through the passage together just to familiarise ourselves. So we're in Ephesians chapter 5 and we're reading from verses 1 to 14. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Well, since this is such a practical passage and it's all about doing and being, I thought I'd try this morning to summarise each of these three main sections with an active word, a verb. And since it seems to be the dumb thing amongst pastors to have all your points beginning with the same letter, I thought I'd give that a go. Why not? And the first section is pretty easy. The verb is provided for us there. It's uh, imitate. And the last section's not too difficult either because it's all about light. So we're going to go with illuminate for that one. But do you think I could think of a word beginning with I to describe the essence of what Paul is telling us to do or not to do in that middle section of this passage. I could not. And if you can, maybe there could be a prize waiting for you. So since imitate and illuminate conveniently have the same endings, I've instead stretched my brain in that direction and come up with a very old school word, which I think sums it up pretty well, abjugate. Imitate, abjugate and illuminate. Three actions that should form part of our grateful response to all that God has done for us. And we're going to work our way through each of those three this morning. Well, the passage for today began, therefore, be imitators of God. And I think that all of us know what it is to imitate. And we also all know that there are some who can do it pretty well and pull off a very credible likeness of an, another person. And there are others that do it pretty badly. There are some that imitate, say, Elvis Presley or Abba or others, and you could hardly tell them apart when you go to a, a performance. 
And yet there are others that you would struggle to even think who it is that they're trying to imitate. We've all seen them and we've all heard them. And we know that there's varying degrees of our ability to imitate someone else. There's at least one Elvis Presley impersonator that I am aware of who's actually been banned for his own good from competing in some competitions because the likeness that he presents is apparently so far from the original that those watching actually become angry. As imitators of God, we don't want to leave people with any doubts. And we certainly don't want to misrepresent God to them. The likeness that we present must be faithful and as true as it can be to the original. How might we go about that? Well, if you wanted to imitate, say, Elvis Presley, for example, you would find out everything you could about him. You would look at all the old video footage. You would listen to whatever soundtrack you could. You would read magazine articles, anything that you could get your hands on to help you find out what he's like. You'd be there wanting to study it. You would know exactly the position of every stud or piece of sequence on his outfits. You would know exactly how wide those flares on the bottom of his trousers needed to be. You would know exactly how he styles his hair. You would know how he moves on stage. You'd know how he responds in interviews. You would listen to his songs over and over again. You would see his facial features and be able to imitate those. And you would know every word of every song that he's ever sung. You'd get your hands on video recordings and magazines. In short, anything or anyone that could help you fill in some details about his life, you'd be there trying to find it out. And you would probably devote an inordinate amount of time towards tracking all of these things and people down and learning from them whatever you could. In the same way, if we are to be like God, we need to know God. We need to really know him. We need to know what he's like. We need to know his character. We need to know how he interacts with his people. And all of that you will find in the record that he's left behind for us, the Bible. You will find in there his relentless pursuit of humanity and his plan for their reconciliation to him. You'll find in it his dealings with Israel right throughout the Old Testament. You'll find it in the law and the radical way for, for that time that the law made provision for widows and orphans and the poor and foreigners. You'll find it in the prophets who spoke of a God of new beginnings. And you'll most definitely find it in the record of Jesus, God incarnate, who came to this earth and loved us and freely gave himself as a sacrifice for us. You can't imitate what you don't know. Well, you can, but you won't do a very good job. And it's very difficult to get to know God if you ignore the primary record that we have of his life or of Jesus' life on earth. So I can't emphasise enough how important it is to read your Bible because it contains so much of what God wants us to know about himself. The trouble is, though, that the more you know of God, eventually the more you will realise just how impossible it is for any human being ever to pull off a credible imitation of God. But far from being a reason for discouragement, this realisation is actually the point that all of us must come to if our journey of spiritual transformation is to begin. If we are to become like Christ and therefore imitators of God, we need to get to that point where we realise that we can't do it on our own. And until we come to that point, 
we're only going to make God look bad and ourselves look foolish by our efforts to imitate him. Now, we are almost coming towards the end of of the Olympics right at the moment. So when I was trying to think about what it might look like for us to try and imitate God on our own, my mind went straight away to one of my favourite Olympic events, the equestrian, and in particular, the dressage. It's a wonderful display of partnership between human and animal, between the human and the horse. And when it's done well... It is beautiful to watch. It's it's a bit like ballet, but with a horse involved. But if you try and imitate dressage without a horse, you're going to end up looking silly. The end result may well be amusing, but it won't be dressage. If you go online, you'll actually be able to find a video of a man doing just that. He does an eight-minute dressage routine only instead of riding a real horse, he's riding one of those horse heads on a stick. We used to call them hobby horses in the UK. In in the US, they call them stick horses. And he's straddling one of these stick horses. Grown man, fully kitted out, top hat, tails, white jodhpurs, calf length, perfectly polished black boots, riding in an equestrian arena, performing a full routine set to music. He's got all the right moves going. He's got his pirouettes. He's got his extended canter. He's leading with the left and leading with the right and then leading with alternate legs. But he looks ridiculous because there's no real horse and it's not possible for a man to pass off a credible imitation of a horse no matter how closely he studied the moves. Now, sadly for me, much of this morning's message was visual and all of that kind of came to a crashing halt at 5pm on Thursday when we received the news of this latest lockdown. So I think I'm going to follow up on Monday morning with a, a couple of links sent out via email so that you can actually see the things that I wanted you to see because I'm sure like me, you will all be astounded to know that stick horse dressage is actually a thing. I wasn't the first person to have thought about it. People have actually thought of it before me. And what's more, they've actually done it. And I've spent way too much time this week online watching stick horse dressage routines. I even made Pastor Glenn watch a stick horse dressage routine and made him help me look for the two stick horses that we used to own in playgroup, thinking that, well, if I can't show you it, Uh, on a video, maybe he and I could do our own routine. But alas, the two stick horses must have gone to the stick horse knackery sometime during our building program because they were nowhere to be found. So until your Monday morning email, you'll just have to take my word for it that it's very entertaining, particularly the group performances. It's also undoubtedly a great way to keep fit, but it has nothing of the grace the precision or the beauty of the real thing because a human cannot authentically imitate a horse. We aren't built like horses and even if we were, you need more than just a horse for dressage. To be sure, the horse does most of the work but dressage is a partnership. And in much the same way, the more we know God, the more we realise that it's just not possible for us to be like God because God is perfect and we are flawed human beings. And yet this is what the Apostle Paul tells us to do here. So there must be a way for it to be possible. And Jesus said, I am the way. He is the gateway to a beautiful partnership with the Holy Spirit who can make it possible for us flawed human beings to imitate God without doing a disservice to God and without making ourselves look foolish in the process. And this process of imitating God is called spiritual transformation and we've talked about that earlier in the year. And it begins at that point of knowing God 
wanting to be more like him, but realising that in our fallen and sinful state, we fall so far short of God, that it's just not possible for us to be like him on our own. And when we realise that we can't do it on our own, that's when that journey of spiritual transformation begins. Remember the Beatitudes that we did earlier in the year, Matthew chapter 5. We worked our way through them. They are Jesus' roadmap for spiritual transformation. They are the means by which we can become authentic imitators of God. Remember Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, the poor in spirit recognise their great need and they recognise that need as a spiritual need. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Having recognised their great need, that journey of becoming more like Christ begins. It begins with self-examination, with the recognition of our own unworthiness and sorrow over our own great sin. Blessed are the meek, said Jesus, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek people turn themselves over to God to be shaped and formed by him. And when they do, all sorts of changes start to take place. Mourning is replaced by a deep longing to do what God desires. We begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And likewise with those other Beatitudes. As our hearts are made one with Christ, Mercy is extended to others and we desire purity and reconciliation or peace with others. It is through spiritual transformation that it becomes possible for us to imitate God and spiritual transformation is a partnership. So yes, we are to be imitators of God, but in doing so we must realise that this is not about us pretending to be like God, trying to do a few good deeds, forcing ourselves to do these things in effort to be more like him. Our ability to imitate God happens through spiritual transformation and that is primarily the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It is a partnership and a partnership that we must do all we can to ensure that it prospers but it's not a partnership of equals. Because we are dearly loved children, the Father has sent his Holy Spirit to us and it is he who does a work of transformation in us, enabling us to be imitators of God. So what does it look like when we allow this partnership to flourish? Well, Paul tells us as dearly loved children, our lives should look more and more like Christ's as we are transformed more and more to be like him. So we will live a loving and self-sacrificial life just as he did. And as this partnership with the Holy Spirit flourishes, we will progress along that pathway, becoming little by little, day by day, more and more like Christ and therefore better imitators of God. And along the way, there will be some things that we need to steer clear of or separate ourselves from because they are simply not compatible with a holy God. And I've chosen this word abjugate to describe what is required in this next section, not only because it rhymes with imitate and illuminate, but because I think it provides for us a nice picture of what's required here. The word abjugate is an ancient word. It comes from the Latin abugo. And the ab in that word means from or away from, and the ugo means to bind or connect. So to abjugate means to unyoke or to set free. So when you're yoked to something, you become bound to it or to them. And it's that image that we're familiar with because we've heard it before. 
uh, in this place of the, the two oxen that are held together by that wooden yoke around their necks. And they're yoked together for the purposes of work. They would pull a plough or pull a, another implement for tillage. And where one goes, the other must go because they're yoked together and they can no longer function independently. And I think that image describes nicely what Paul means here. As imitators of God, seeking to walk in love, we can't continue to be yoked to all of these things mentioned in verses 3 to 7 because they'll pull us in the wrong direction. We need to unyoke from them. So what are these things that Paul talks about? We'll move through them one by one. The word translated as sexual immorality here is derived from the Greek pornea, which shares a common root word with that English word pornography. So sexual immorality here is very broadly defined to include all sexual activity outside of marriage. It includes watching pornography. It includes visiting strip shows. It includes reading erotic novels. And as Jesus said in the, his Sermon on the Mount, he extended it out to include lust. It includes lust as well. The word that's translated as impurity is the Greek akathasia. It's related to our English word catharsis, but it's a negative form of this word. So whereas something cathartic is something cleansing, something acathartic is something that pollutes. So impurity is anything that is polluting to us. So we think sinful habits, think addictions, think moral failings, all of those things that cause us guilt and shame. The word translated covetousness can also be translated as greed. It's, it's listed as greed in the NIV. They're, the two are closely related because greed causes us to look longingly on what others have and desire those things for ourselves. So these three things, sexual immorality, impurity and greed, these three, says Paul, are the works that we need to unyoke ourselves from. He says they should not even be named among the believers. But our speech is also important. It's not just what we do, but what or how we, we speak. Filthiness that he mentions refers to degrading talk. It's that kind of talk that robs other people of their dignity. It can include innuendo or suggestive type of speech. The word translated foolishness comes from the root word from which we get the English word moron. So it's pointless talk that is of no use to anyone. And crude joking, I think we all know what that is. It's that type of humour that is full of double entendres and it twists and takes something that is relatively innocent to make it into something which is, is crude. All of these things, sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness or greed, filthiness, foolish talk and crude joking, they all have the same result. They pull us away from God. And if we remain yoked to these things, we will not be faithful imitators of God. Paul says, abjugate, be unyoked from them. Jesus calls us to come and instead be yoked to him. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30, come to me, he says, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now all of us are yoked to something, and whatever it is that we're yoked to will influence the way that we live our lives 
and it'll determine the direction that we are heading. And so when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, it's a call to all who are weary from being pulled this way and that, from trying to do things in their own strength. That kind of yoke might feel good for a while. It might even seem like a freedom of sorts, but it is ill-fitting. It rubs and it calluses and it eventually leaves scars and people get hurt in that kind of yoke and are led away from God ultimately. Jesus calls people to come and take his yoke upon them because his yoke is easy, he says, and his burden is light. It's not easy because it requires no effort, but because it's been designed for us, like the wooden yoke that has been custom made for the individual animal, built to suit that animal. It's comfortable on the animal. It doesn't cause scars and and chafing. This is what God intended for us. And when we unyoke ourselves from all of these things in verses 3 and 4 and join ourselves instead to Jesus, he will lead and guide us all the way and we will find rest for our souls. When we do that, we will be for everyone who is looking on at us a far better imitator of God one that will indeed demonstrate his wisdom in the heavenly realms. So having detailed all the words and the deeds of those still in darkness, Paul urges the Ephesians not to partner with them. Notice what he says here, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And what he doesn't say here is as important as what he does say. He doesn't say at one time you were walking in darkness, but now you walk in the light. And he doesn't say you were in darkness, but now you're in the light. No, he says you were darkness. You were part of it. Darkness was your identity, but it is your identity no more. As dearly loved children of God, we have a new identity in Christ. 1 John 1.5 says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And that's the identity that we share now when we are yoked to Christ. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, says Paul. Nothing, not one thing. Steer clear of them at all costs. Now, Richard Koken, in his little book, tells the story of a billionaire who owned a magnificent yacht. And he began interviewing sailors, professional sailors, to skipper this multi-million dollar yacht for him so that when he brought clients or his well-to-do friends, he could take them out into the harbour. And he needed someone with very great sailing skills who could be available at any time whenever needed to take he and his guests out sailing. And eventually he narrowed the field down to just three candidates. Each of them had an impeccable sailing record. Each of them had impeccable references. And so he decided to give each one an opportunity to demonstrate their skills by taking his multi-million dollar yacht out on the harbour. Well, the first one sailed the priceless yacht at top speed with great precision, a mere 30 metres from the rocky shoreline and the rocky cliffs. And everyone was amazed by his great skill. The second went one better. He did exactly the same thing, only instead of being 30 metres from the shoreline, he was a mere 15 metres from that rocky cliff. And so, of course, there was much excitement and much anticipation when it came to the opportunity of the third to skipper the yacht. He took the helm. He calmly guided the yacht away from the rocks, away from the cliff and out into the middle of the harbour where the sailing party spent the afternoon touring around 
and enjoying the stunning views. To everyone's surprise, the billionaire yacht owner gave the job to the third candidate. All of you, he said, were amazingly skillful. But my yacht is precious. And I don't want someone at the helm who is so confident as to be tempted to steer it within a few metres of the rocks. One mistake and it's disaster. And God does not want his children of the light to keep toying with darkness. Sail in the harbour. Walk as children of the light, for there is much joy and satisfaction to be found there. Don't risk steering close to the rocks. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, says Paul. Instead, let your light illuminate the darkness, exposing the fruitlessness of what is done in darkness. Turn off the TV if what you're seeing is immoral or impure or full of filthy language or built around crude innuendo. Find yourself some new friends if gaining their approval requires you to drink too much or to pretend to be enjoying their crude jokes. Don't flirt with immorality. You are a precious child of God. You are a child of light. Live a life that reflects that new identity. Why? Because that's the kind of life that God has chosen for his children. And he's chosen it because it is good for you and because it is the kind of life that will show others his manifold wisdom. The harbour is a great place to sail. It makes no sense to sail close to the rocks when there's a beautiful harbour to sail in. Hit the rocks and you might be living with that wreckage for the rest of your life. Not only you, but perhaps your family and friends also. Now that kind of damage is usually measurable in one way or another. But the damage that we might do to God's reputation when we imitate him poorly or claim to be light but instead keep flirting with darkness, that kind of damage is untold. Think of the many and varied reasons for which Christians are labelled hypocrites. When those who claim to be believers commit adultery or they abuse children or they defraud businesses or they lie to their colleagues or they participate in gossip or they laugh at dirty jokes going around the office or they treat their spouses poorly at home or they fail to forgive or are willing to take advantage of another for their own gain or they simply don't display a loving attitude toward others. What great damage is done when this is the image of our God that we portray. Paul concludes this little section with his take on a promise that is found in Isaiah, Isaiah 60, verse 1. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Most likely, this is a section from a very early Christian hymn. Awake from the spiritual death of sin, rise to new life in Christ, and his life-giving light will shine on you. How well are you imitating God? How well am I imitating God? Are we actively fostering that partnership with the Holy Spirit that will allow us to imitate God well? Is it obvious to our friends outside of the four walls of the church building that we are children of light? Have we abjugated or fully unyoked from those things that would pull us back towards darkness? And does the light of the Lord, which we now bear, illuminate the darkness around us? 
There's plenty in this passage for us to think about as we go into another week locked down at home. Would you join with me in prayer? Lord God, if there is anything in me that I need to unyoke from because it is pulling me away from you and making me a poor imitator of you, would you show it to me today and help me to break free from it? Lord, I want to shine for you in my sphere of influence. Help me to be more like Jesus. Amen. Well, the closing song that I have chosen for us this morning is called Death Was Arrested. And it might be new to some of you, but I think it captures very well that turning point in our lives when we are released by Christ and move from darkness into light. That moment when death was arrested and for us new life began. Before we sing it, let me bless you. May the majesty of the Father be the light by which you walk. May the compassion of the Son be the love by which you walk. And may the presence of his Holy Spirit be the power by which you walk. This week and every week. Amen. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested my life began ash was redeemed only beauty my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet and our feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began Oh, your grace so free washes But then Jesus